Okay, well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another in our series of webinars for History Reclaimed. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Tim Luckhurst, uh, one of the uh, founding members and supporters of History Reclaimed. Uh, Tim is, is the principal of South College in the University of Durham, and he has a very distinguished career both in journalism and the teaching of journalism and the history of journalism. Uh, before he was at Durham, he was at, at the University of Kent, where he set up the School of Journalism in that university. Uh, but going back, uh, he began work as a journalist and broadcaster, working on Radio 4's Today program, um, and indeed published uh, in 2001, a biography of today, a book uh, taking us behind the scenes uh, into the making and the, the politics of the Today programme. He helped design and launch Radio 5 for the BBC. He then had extensive experience of print journalism uh, as deputy editor of The Scotsman and for a little while editor as well. Um, and through it all, he's been a doughty opponent of state regulation of the press. Uh, and he's made that clear as both an author and a journalist. Um, he's contributed to a wide array of journalistic and historical um, uh, periodicals, uh, but most recently he's brought together uh, his experience of journalism and of history uh, to publish uh, earlier this year his book, Reporting the Second World War, the Press and the People, 1939 to 1945. And it's about that fascinating subject that Tim is going to talk to us today. Uh, so Tim, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Lawrence. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, newspaper history has not escaped unharmed the damage that the culture warriors have sought to inflict on our discipline. Indeed, I suggest it was a fairly early target. The small community of media historians has been influenced since the 1960s by people who actively dislike newspapers. And these radical media historians rely deny accounts on which British journalists, politicians and informed citizens have long been accustomed to depend. I date the growth of their modern influence to the publication in 1978 of an essay by George Boyce, The Fourth Estate, The Reappraisal of a Concept, in which Boyce expressed real contempt for the suggestion that privately owned commercial newspapers free of regulation by the state can serve the public sphere. And he spawned a number of imitators who share a second characteristic, extreme reluctance to actually engage with the content of newspapers. These views have been widely promoted by James Curran, whose contribution to Power Without Responsibility is often the only academic work read by students seeking a basic understanding of, journal understanding of journalism history. I encourage those I teach to read my retort, which I wrote in contribution to the Leveson Inquiry. As Responsibility Without Power demonstrates, my research is based on liberal assumptions. It defends a 300-year-old consensus dating back to from the abolition of press li licensing in 1694. I think newspapers escaped the last remnant of official control when Parliament repealed newspaper stamp duty in 1855. An immersion in newspaper journalism has reinforced my view that British newspapers perform a valuable service to democracy precisely because they're not regulated by the state. Britain's distinctive identity as a democracy without a written constitution imposes on journalists duties they must perform if our representative institutions are to function efficiently. Generations of Britons have learned that in the UK, checks and balances on power are exercised in the public interest by the courts and the press. And this is additionally important because in Britain, executive and legislature are not legally separate as they are in the United States. In Britain, state reg regulation would, re would create an absurdity ministerial scrutiny of titles the electorate depends upon for their scrutiny of ministers. So, in reporting the Second World War, I seek to balance accounts of British wartime journalism that depict the BBC as the sole major media player, and I assess the performance of Britain's national newspapers against their own professed ideals. Historians have explored extensively the BBC's broadcast journalism during the Second World War, and those seeking helpful introductions to its wartime history should certainly read Gene Seaton's contributions to Responsibility Without 
to power the that responsibility, sorry. They should also, I suggest, read David Hendy's People's History, which deserves all the praise it's received. I also particularly enjoyed Ed Sturton's Auntie's War, which makes truly excellent use of archives, that diaries, letters and memoirs. The BBC did grow dramatically in scale, prestige and popularity between 1939 and 1945. But less well understood is that newspapers mattered greatly throughout the war. In May 1940, Mass Observation produced its report on the press, and it found that almost everybody reads newspapers, whether regularly or irregularly, thoroughly or cursorily. And Mass Observation's interest was not restricted to the extent of newspaper sales. It also ought to understand why Britons bought newspapers. And the answer was that newspapers provide topics for the day's conversation. They tell us what's happening. Without newspaper news, there is scarcely any accepted basis for conversation except the weather. Newspapers, concluded MO, was, were a social necessity. And as the Second World War began, Britons were already the world's most avid readers. The habit of buying one or more daily national newspapers extended to every social class. 80% of British families read one of the mass circulation London dailies, the Mail, Mirror, Express, News Chronicle, Daily Herald or Daily Sketch, and two thirds of middle class families shared this habit, though many also bought a sophisticated title such as the Times, Daily Telegraph or Manchester Guardian. A pre-war survey by Political and Economic Planning found that a sample of 100 British families bought 95 daily newspapers, 58 daily evening titles and 130 Sunday newspapers each week. So did these newspapers do their duty according to the liberal purposes which I've identified? My approach during two years immersed rather happily in the archives was to test their performance against Michael Shudson's Six Things News Can Do for Democracy. To these I add that newspaper journalists also owe their readers eyewitness reporting of important events. As Alan Little, my former colleague and partner in crime at the BBC has explained, eyewitness reporting has the power to close down propaganda. It can challenge myth-making and create a valuable first draft. In the book, I apply these tests to 13 wartime case studies. Today, I'll focus on four. They demonstrate that whilst they supported the war effort, British newspapers lost neither their editorial independence nor their willingness to challenge, criticise and confront. Their conduct annoyed ministers from all three major political parties in the wartime coalition. And contrary to established orthodoxy, wartime newspapers were determined to protect their readers' interests and challenge those who exercised power over their lives. In the book, sorry, my first case study deals with newspaper reporting of air raid shelter policy during the Blitz. Now, as I'm sure we all recognise, many depictions of shelters on film and on television and in popular history depict Londoners sheltering in underground railway stations. Of course, the government was initially determined that Londoners should not use the tube and Anderson shelters, a private alternative, required a garden, which many working people did not have. Reporting London's first experience of intense bombardment by the Luftwaffe, Ed Morrow of CBS adopted a positive tone. The British capital was taking a pounding, he noted, but Londoners were acclimatising to the danger. They'd become more human, less formal. There was, thought Morrow, almost a small town atmosphere about the place. People were drawing together. Newspapers were rather more honest. They recognised a less harmonious reality. During the phony war, Evacuation from the cities had revealed misunderstanding and absence of trust between rich and poor Londoners. Bombing threatened to exacerbate those differences. Official policy, actively promoted by the Home Secretary Sir John Anderson, encouraged Londoners who could not use Anderson shelters or cellars to seek refuge in one of 5,000 brick and concrete surface shelters. Many proved reluctant to use them, and their fears were exacerbated when surface shelters collapsed, crushing those inside. A report in the left-wing Popular Daily Mirror on 14th September 1940 explained the solution chosen spontaneously by EastEnders rendered homeless by bombing. The Mirror reminded readers that strict instructions had been issued at the outbreak of war that tube stations should not be used as shelters. Now it suggested need had rendered that ruling unenforceable. Bombed out Londoners were streaming into the tube stations. And equipped with shorthand and good awareness of his newspaper's core demographic, the Mirror reporter gathered quotes from eyewitnesses. 
Mrs. Stenner, a young mother nursing her baby son, explained that she'd seen their home wiped out by bombs. She and her family had tried sleeping in a public surface shelter, but bombs dropped all around them. A policeman had suggested she try the underground. And spontaneous flight to the underground and other deep underground stations was hard to prevent. But the government was not persuaded to give it official approval. Sir John Anderson gave the Daily Mail an interview. He declared himself unshaken in his opposition to the building of deep shelters. They'd take too long to build, they'd require the use of large quantities of scarce building materials, and he was very much against the practice of gathering large numbers of people together in an air raid. And this objection to mass sheltering revealed residual suspicion that mass panic might ensue. Despite a week of heavy raids on London, Sir John remained adamant that national security required people to do as they were told. He told the Daily Mail that he was satisfied that and concrete shelters offered the same protection as underground alternatives. Surface shelters had exceeded all expectations and the government goes, was going to build more of them. However, even to use the mail to encourage obedience, Sir John was exploring alternatives to the surface shelters. The Times had the inside track. In its edition of Tuesday 17th September 1940, it revealed that the Home Secretary was in fact examining with the London Passenger Tra Transport Board possibility of making some use of the tube railways for air raid shelters without, of course, any interference with the transport system. The Times parliamentary correspondent reported that while Sir John consulted, people are already beginning to resort to underground stations having bought tickets. There was much overcrowding in the larger public shelters at night and considerable movement of people from communal and garden shelters near their homes to larger shelters elsewhere. The Daily Mirror shifted rapidly to campaigning mode. It commissioned a column from Tom Wintringham, a former communist who fought in the International Brigade during the Spanish Civil War and was now training local defence volunteers. Wintringham, Wintringham used his column to argue for the use of underground railways as permanent shelters where people can sleep quietly and fairly comfortably. He insisted that the war could not be fought on civil service lines. We're in the front lines. It's time we organised in a front line way. A news story in the Daily Mirror noted that while ministers deliberated, thousands of Londoners again took the matter into their own hands last night and flocked to the tubes for shelter. It described the scene at 4pm at every station between Edgware and the Strand, where families had piled rugs, blankets and pillows for an all-night tenancy. Newspaper concern for the fate of poor Londoners was growing. So the Daily Telegraph sent its intrepid special correspondent, Leonard Marsden Gander, on an extensive tour of London's public air raid shelters. And venturing into parts of the East End that were probably unfamiliar to many of the Telegraph's readers, he noted that while most people chose to remain at home during raids, those who sought shelter show a strong preference for deep shelters. There was a nightly trek from much bombed areas in East London to the Tube and underground stations and to the strong basements and other big buildings of the West End. Unfortunately, con congestion caused by men, women and children sleeping on the platforms was becoming serious. In other words, telegraph readers were finding it difficult to board and disembark from their trains. Newspaper demands for fair access to deep underground air raid shelters added greatly to the pressure that brought about Sir John Anderson's replacement as Home Secretary in October 1940. Pushed hard by the Daily Worker, which accused the government of treating working class lives as disposable, the mass market Daily Mirror and Sunday Pictorial led the way with the assertive campaigning journalism for which they became well known. This included an expose of top West End hotels equipped with safe and comfortable underground shelters that denied access to non-residents even when bombs were falling in the streets outside. Sunday pictorial reporter Bernard Gray had frequently entertained contacts at Claridge's, Barclay and the Ritz. Now, he dressed in the clothes of a working man to test the hotel staff's reaction and went accompanied by a friend Sue, who was similarly attired, to try and see what would happen if he went to the hotel. He was turned away ruthlessly. When the couple reached Claridge's, a heavy raid was underway. Gray approached the porter on duty at the door and asked whether he and Sue could use the shelter. The porter refused them entry, explaining, as a private shelter, it's a public shelter up the road, I should get badly pulled over the coals if I let you in. I can't, it isn't allowed. At the Barclay, a warden standing in front of the revolving doors stepped up to block the passage, declaring, there's a public shelter in Devonshire House, Stratton Street, go there. As they approached the Ritz, the raid was ferocious and Sue ran across the road to the colonnaded passage that runs along the front of the Ritz to this day. Immediately, a porter appeared and ordered them to go to the public shelter. As they turned to leave, a bomb fell nearby, a murdered 
Bernard Gray threw Sue to the ground against the Ritz wall. The bomb, fortunately, exploded too far away to harm them, and Gray later wrote, We refused shelter like any other people dressed like us would be, might have been killed on the doorstep of safety. Richie Calder, Peter Richie Calder, uh, sorry, of the Daily Herald, knew Canning Town and East End of London very well. In the first months of the war, he'd written about the conditions facing children there. And in September 1940, he returned to see how local people were sheltering from bombardment. At a refugee centre located in what security censorship did not allow the Daily Herald to identify as South Hallsville School, Calder found many families who'd been bombed out. They were awaiting motor coaches the local officials told them would come to evacuate them. The buses didn't come. Calder watched men, women and children besiege the officials in charge of the refugee centre, terrified of the bombing, absolutely terrified. They offered to walk to their place of evacuation if only the officials would tell them where it was. The officials had nothing to offer except cups of tea. A high explosive bomb scored a direct hit on South Hallsville School on the night of 10th September. 600 refugees were sheltering there. Calder wrote that official blundering left these people to Hitler's bombs bombs that were practically certain to fall. This tragedy demands an immediate reorganisation of the control and arrangements for receiving the people in bombed areas. His chilling account earned space on the front and back pages of the Daily Herald. The headline was simple, this must not happen again. In autumn 1940, the Communist Daily Worker was the most direct critic of government. It described Sir John Anderson's commitment to surface shelters as calculated class policy. The absence of shelters for the poor demonstrated determination not to provide protection because profit is placed before human lives. In a pungent editorial headlined shelters, 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 it accused the government of cynical and deplorable neglect of the working class. The government had explained, believed that if we provide deep bomb-proof shelters for the whole nation so that people have complete protection, they're going to go underground, then we would lose the war. We cannot expect the civilians to have more protection than our soldiers and sailors. This, this the daily work had announced as a policy of class discrimination dressed up with patriotic frills. Challenges to shelter policy published in newspapers of right, left and centre exploited the absence of policy censorship. The mass market left wing titles infuriated Winston Churchill most. He would nurture intense dislike of the Daily Mirror and Sunday Pictorial, both of which he came to regard as vicious and malignant. My conclusion is that on this topic, newspapers did excellent work. They informed, investigated, told readers about the plight of others less fortunate than themselves, provided a forum for debate and advocated alternative policies. Bernard Gray, Richie Calder and Leonard Gander demonstrated the enduring power of eyewitness reporting. My second case study deals with newspaper coverage of the Beverage Port in August 1941. Sorry. In August 1941, Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill agreed broad principles for the organisation of post-war civilization in the Atlantic Charter, and these were suggested to include enhanced labour standards and social security. Britain's pre-war mix of pensions, unemployment insurance and health insurance did not offer comprehensive coverage. So there was broad agreement that something better was needed, and this political consensus was driven by wartime civil servants. Sir William Beveridge was the king amongst them. He learned the meaning of poverty as a graduate researcher in the East End of London, and now a civil servant, he chaired the Social Insurance Committee. To working people on meagre incomes, the prospect of real cha change was really enticing, and in November 1942, expectation grew that Beveridge would produce something truly exciting. He led such expectations in a conversation with a Daily Telegraph reporter. The co Conservative broadsheet, sorry, forgive me, my lights go off and I have to get up and, get, and make them go back on again, so forgive me for that. Yes. Um, the, there was broad agreement that something better was needed. Now, Sir William Beveridge decided that he was going to offer that alternative. To working people on really meagre incomes, the prospect of real change was very exciting, and expectation grew that Beveridge would produce something so exciting. The Conservative broadsheet, the Daily Telegraph, reported that Sir William's proposals would take us halfway to Moscow. Sir William concluded that Britain must go halfway unless we want to be landed there altogether. A completely new system of social security was required. The British people would not be satisfied by mere tinkering. Beveridge was furious about the Telegraph's version of his plans, but despite his protestations, it was clear that he had briefed their reporter in detail. He'd spoken to the Times as well. It predicted a state paper of outstanding importance. 
When Beveridge's proposals were not published immediately, the Daily Mirror spelt conspiracy. Watchful on behalf of its readers, the Mirror feared the coalition was determined to be too polite to itself. An editorial urged the Labour leadership to accept that Beveridge's report must be discussed and debated in public. It cannot be infinitely pigeonholed on the excuse that it might disturb the national unity or equanimity of those who see Moscow in any proposal for social reform. The Sunday pictorial raised expectations with a prediction that Beveridge's recommendations would include full employment, national planning and extension of state activity in the economic sphere. Daily Telegraph detected a socialist threat. It urged the government to take its time and think very hard, but the Telegraph reflected the interests of its conservative readers and advertisers, and the Times was equally aware that its readers included civil servants, academics and teachers. In the week before the Beveridge Report was published, it offered two extended editorials. Freedom from Idleness argued that private enterprise was a good ship that had brought us far, but post-war reform would require elements of the wartime system that we have limited, that have limited conflict between capital and labour. A second, Obligations of Victory, recognised that victory would bring urgent demands for freedom from want, but social progress was essential. Anything less would discredit and destroy the coalition and the parties composing it. The Times it's insisted that the government must have a social policy as well as a military policy. When the report was actually published on Tuesday 1st December 1942, popular newspapers gave it huge publicity. The Daily Mirror's headline was Banish Want from Cradle to Grave Plan. In the beautifully designed edition, it explained and depicted what the plan does for everyone and how to be born, bred and buried by beverage. The Daily Herald shared the Mirror's enthusiasm, reported Hugh Pilcher devised an imaginary working class family and described their life in beverage Britain. The Daily Mail declared that Beveridge's proposals would create a world sensation. They marked a big step forward in the march of human progress. Sir William's report was one of the most remarkable state documents of our time. But Illingworth, the Daily Mail cartoonist, Beveridge offered a rare and refreshing route to a brave new world. However, the Mail did not abandon its critical faculties. Indeed, it identified a problem that would torment an Iron Bevan when he worked to create the NHS. What would happen to doctors? How would they be paid? Beveridge was obliged to admit that he didn't know. He told the Mail that doctors might be paid salaries, they might be paid on a panel system, they might be paid on a mixture of the two. He didn't know it was somebody else's job to answer this question. He thought it was the next big thing that needed to be tackled. For the Manchester Guardian, the report heralded a British revolution. Beveridge's proposals should be implemented in full. The New York Herald Tribune, William Shira described it as a revolutionary document. For the Times, Beveridge had transformed the phrase freedom from want from a vague aspiration to a plainly realisable project. Amidst the euphoria and intense speculation on the killer and pressure on the coalition to act fast, it took the perspective of a weekly news magazine to really offer insight. The Economist understood what daily newspapers had not. This was not an insurance plan. Payments in would not meet the forecasts of payment out. Beveridge had devised a plan that must be supplemented by general taxation. There would be a requirement for heavy expenditure from the National, National Exchequer. Success would depend on economic growth. And the economist was also deeply concerned that Sir William might encourage the growth of a class of drones with no ambition to rise above drone status. So the Beveridge report had support from newspapers of left, right and centre. But the Prime Minister's first instinct was, as the Mirror had predicted, to prevaricate. And Labour ministers didn't put him under immense pressure. They worried that Beveridge dealt with issues that trade unions regarded as theirs alone. The Commons debated the proposal in February 1943 and treated it simply as a peg for a debate. Reporting of the Beveridge report showcased the freedom newspapers could exercise when liberated from security concerns. Conservative titles acknowledged that economic and social reform would be essential when the fighting ended, but they insisted it should not be Marxist in character. The Daily Mail identified an important omission. On the left and centre, newspapers championed Beveridge's ambitions and put the government, particularly the Labour part of the coalition, under intense pressure to refine and implement the proposals immediately. Newspapers offered their readers detailed information and explanation of the Beveridge plan. They identified challenges and demanded action from a cabinet that was reluctant to offer any commitment. Again, 
they spoke truth to power on behalf of their readers. The weekly political press provided additional insight and challenge. It was a role entitled, sorry, the titles including the listener, new statesman, economist and spectator would perform throughout the war. Indeed, one of the most intriguing discoveries in reading these is that titles for highly educated readers came under much less pressure to conform to government wishes than the mass circulation titles. It's fairly apparent that ministers regarded them as a safe way to demonstrate Britain's commitment to press freedom. Left free to publish and debate dissenting ideas, they helped to burnish Britain's democratic credentials, but they were only read by a minority of thoughtful opinion formers and therefore were unlikely to really disturb the public and to cause division. Next, I shall describe newspaper coverage of what we call the Holocaust. British National Dailies identified the brutality of Nazi race laws before the war began. The Manchester Guardian, Times and Daily Herald published accounts of lynchings and described the ruthless regime enforced in the concentration camps. However, whilst these accounts were graphic, Stephanie Searle offers the important caveat that their reporting was preconditioned by liberal thinking. They imagined that exposing brutality to scrutiny might moderate Nazi conduct. In September 1942, the Manchester Guardian collated accounts smuggled out of Czechoslovakia. It identified a vast system of organised traffic in human beings, in which the fit may survive for as long as they are useful, the aged and the unfit may perish at will. And the Manchester Guardian special correspondent described how young Jewish citizens were exploited as forced labour. They survived on the most meagre rations and accommodation that was totally inadequate, sanitation non-existent and the mortality rate high. He described how a group of young Ju single Jewish men selected their good health and usefulness as labourers had been sent from Terezin to Upper Silesia. Nothing had been heard from them since. In October 1942, two months before Anthony Eden described the final solution in the House of Commons, the Manchester Guardian returned to the topic in a leader entitled simply Extermination. It explained that Jews from Poland, Holland and Belgium had already been rounded up, deprived of their belongings, packed together in cattle trucks and transported to the notorious concentration camps in Poland. French Jews were suffering the same brutality. Persecution was beginning in Italy, Hungary and Romania. The Daily Express, most successful of the mass market con conservative dailies, put on its front page Eden's explanation that the German government was deporting all Jews from occupied countries to Eastern Europe and putting them to death. It concluded Eden's vice, advice that able-bodied our study work to death in labour camps, the infirm are left to die of exposure and starvation or are deliberately murdered in mass executions. The Daily Mail described the Jews Germany's slaughtering and history's most infamous act. The Daily Mirror welcomed the news that Germany's colder-blooded extermination of the Jews had been broadcast from London to listeners all over the world. The Sunday Pictorial described the foulest crime on earth and a horror that numbs the mind. In the spring of 1944, Germany began the mass deportation of Hungarian Jews, the last Jewish community left in Europe. A leader in the Times noted that they were marked for extermination and identified a distinction between so-called concentration camps and the death camps of Poland, which are in fact slaughterhouses. The Daily Telegraph condemned the deportation and elimination of the last organized Jewish community in Europe. It declared that outraged humanity can but strive to rid the earth of this monstrous wickedness. In the House of Commons, the Foreign Secretary condemned the barbarous deportations he recorded his regret that nothing Britain or its allies said about post-war punishment of the perpetrators appeared to make any difference. The Daily Herald commended even strong words, but warned that nobody could expect that they would be effective. Brendan Bracken, Minister of Information, explained that the Germans had set up abattoirs in Europe. It was the biggest scandal in the history of human crime. And the following morning, 8th of July, 1944, the Times reported that the gas chambers at Auschwitz could still kill 6,000 victims every day, and the Manchester Guardian added evidence sent by its special co correspondent in Switzerland that 400,000 Hungarian Jews had already died at Auschwitz and Birkenau. Many had died en route in the squalid cattle trains. <laughs> 
Many may be familiar with the controversy over the BBC's delayed transmission of Richard Dimbleby's report from Belson. However, British newspapers were able to respond to the American liberation of Buchenwald several days before they learned about Belson. Morrow entered Buchenwald on 12th April 1945 and CBS broadcast his account on the 15th of April. It appeared in British newspapers. The Daily Mirror told its readers that the existence of death and torture camps should come as no surprise. Noting that such camps had been a Nazi tool since before the war, it questioned whether it was really possible that there is one solitary person in these islands who does not know. The Mirrors advised readers that they had a sacred duty to learn the facts. Pictures for the liberated camps helped the newspapers to describe the horror. Reporters and correspondents struggled to convey what they saw, but many did so with skill. Christopher Buckley of the Daily Telegraph described the fiendish cruelties and inhuman callousness of the camps. He found it impossible to reconcile with the apparent kindness of ordinary citizens. Close reading confirms that from 1941 onwards, the Manchester Guardian actively sought to confirm that Hitler was pursuing the absolute annihilation of the Jewish people in Europe. Other broadsheet newspapers, notably the Times and Daily Telegraph, followed the emerging evidence and reported it honestly, but without consistent prominence. Popular titles reported accurately evidence offered by the World Jewish Congress, the Polish government and statements by British ministers. There was also no conspiracy of silence and certainly no effort to conceal. A diligent reader determined to understand the fate of Hitler's Jewish victims could know a great deal. But Britain had not gone to war to defend the Jewish people. Newspapers regarded the war first as one for national survival and then as a defense of democracy against totalitarianism. For most Britons, it was fought for territory and the right to live in freedom. I conclude that when the Daily Mirror asked if there was really anybody in Britain who did not know the truth about the concentration camps, it protested far too much. There were many who did not know, many who chose not to know, and their newspapers did not give the sub subject sufficiently consistent high profile to challenge such ignorance. Newspaper reporting of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki reached clear conclusions much more rapidly. Initially, newspapers were simply stunned by the technology. The Manhattan Project was an intensely guarded secret. Beyond a tiny elite, the atomic bomb was unheard of and unimagined. British newspapers responded with a combination of awe at the scientific achievement and patriotic pride in the British contribution. The Manchester Guardian, its first report of the Hiroshima bomb, described it as the result of immense cooperative effort by ourselves and the United States. The Daily Mail's correspondent in New York went straight to the point. Japan faced obliteration by the mightiest destructive force the world has ever known. The Times explained why the bomb had been built in America. When it was first conceived, Britain was still within the easy range of German bombers and the risk of raiders from the sea or air could not be ignored. The Daily Telegraph celebrated the contribution of scientists at Birmingham, Cambridge, Imperial College London and Liverpool University. Briefings from the Ministry of Information and the US War Department informed all the initial reporting in the British press and these focused on the bomb's colossal power and the outstanding science that had devised it. Such destruction was the astonishing product of an Anglo-US war secret of four years research, explained the Times. But the Times also offered a clue to why controversy didn't emerge immediately. An impenetrable cloud of dust and smoke had covered the target area after the atom bomb had been dropped. Pictures of the devastation and the pitiful condition of survivors did not emerge quickly, and the US War Department was determined that they should not. But concern emerged nevertheless in the immediate aftermath of Hiroshima. Winston Churchill, so recently exiled from Downing Street, recognized that this revelation of the secrets of nature, long mercifully withheld from man, should arouse the most solemn reflections in the mind and conscience of every human capable of comprehension. His column appeared in the Daily Mail on 7th August 1945 under the headline, Most Terrifying Weapon in History. Under the headline, just suppose it had happened here, the Daily Mirror set out to explain the impact if an atomic bomb had fallen on Britain. This it did by asking reporters around the UK to assess what complete destruction of four square miles would look like in their city. It covered virtually every major conurbation, but having grown up in Edinburgh, I'll use my example of Edinburgh. The Mirror reported that in a square bounded by Bonington Toll and Cumley Bank, Morningside and King Arthur's seat, there would be nothing but destruction. All historic Edinburgh would have disappeared. 
The first official pictures were published on 9th August. The Times reflected that most of Hiroshima no longer exists and blasted corpses too numerous to count litter the ruined city. Practically all living things, human and animal, were literally seared to death by the tremendous heat and pressure engendered by the blast. The Nagasaki bomb polarised opinion. To the communist Dorothy Thompson, writing in The Observer, the atomic bomb awed and frightened its own users. If we're no longer fully at war, we're not yet at peace. The mood of mankind has altered and the constellation of power has decisively changed for all foreseeable time. On 5th September, the Daily Mail reported that doctors in Hiroshima were seeing patients die at a rate of about 100 per day from the continuing effects of the bomb. The Daily Express carried a report by William Burchett, the first Western journalist to enter Hiroshima. He described his account as a warning to the world and told the city reduced to reddish rubble and people dying from an unknown atomic plague. I've for offered you four examples of wartime newspaper reporting. My book contains many more and those who share my fascination with newspapers may find the chapters on abdication, appeasement, the phony war, the Allied bombing campaign against Germany, etc. particularly interesting. Reporting the Second World War has been a joy to write when complete immersion in the archives has revealed numerous examples of meticulous reporting, incisive commentary and acute analysis. Newspapers didn't always oppose the government. The coalition of 1940 was fighting a just war. Its composition meant that newspapers of all mainstream political complexions had ministers in office with whom they might expect their readers to agree. Nevertheless, while promoting patriotic fervour, wartime newspapers did frequently perform their duty. They investigated policy, they explained complex issues, they enabled informed debate. Correspondents who actually travelled with and were accredited by the Allied armies were subject to intense scrutiny and meticulous management. Many of them wrote memoirs, and I think their accounts have tainted the reputation of the newspapers for which they wrote, without acknowledging that the copy they supplied was a tiny minority of what appeared in newspapers, the bulk of which was written by journalists here in the UK. Wartime newspapers were not tame agents of propaganda. They recognised that their role must be to inform, entertain and defend their readers. In their treatment of issues affecting hearth and home, they were determined and consistent. They challenged injustice, lambasted incompetence and praised progress. Britain's politicians certainly regarded them as the country's most effective influence of opinion. Indeed, a study of the 1945 general election set out to assess their influence. R.B. McCallum and Alison Redmond concluded that Labour supporting daily titles achieved a circulation of about 6 million copies per day, and the Conservatives were backed by titles that sold nearly 7 million throughout the campaign. I conclude that some readers of the Daily Mail and Daily Express ignored their newspaper's political advice. We know that the Royal Commission on the Press, established under Royal Warrant in April 1947, concluded that Britain's newspapers were in fine health and neither government nor advertiser influence compromised their performance. They were inferior to none in the world. We cannot, of course, know how many Britons bought a newspaper primarily to look at cartoons such as Jane and the Daily Mirror, which was immensely popular. We do, however, know that having bought a newspaper, they acquired a title that also brought them essential news and commentary. Wartime newspapers served democracy. They gave it meaning. Their circulation grew in response, and until the success of television in the 1950s, which did offer daunting competition, they were extremely successful. You can read all about it in reporting the Second World War. You can also have a lovely look at Jane in the Daily Mirror and make up for your own, for your, your own minds about what attracted readers most to that newspaper. But remember, whether or not they were attracted by Jane, what they got alongside Jane was incisive reporting, campaigning journalism, intelligent commentary and great analysis. I'm sure many of them actually read some of it too. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Tim. And I hope uh, 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 viewers and listeners can hear and uh, see me and see Tim also. Um, that was most enjoyable and very uh, educational also. I mean, I learned an enormous amount uh, in short compass. So thank you so much. Um, I suppose my, my first question, uh, if I might, Tim, is this. Um, I mean, many historians have argued, it, it, looking at different conflicts in the modern period, that actually democratic societies, because they can mobilize opinion, and because they are open uh, and can motivate 
uh, their populations are perhaps counterintuitively better at fighting wars uh, than autocratic societies. And we may be seeing that in the Ukraine at present, where clearly an open society is much more motivated uh, uh, than, you know, Russian conscripts who don't really know why they're there and, and so far have not put up a very good show. Um, and this argument has been used in the American Civil War, where a democratic North fights a, a South without a, an open and democratic culture. It's true of the First World War. It, it's true of the Second World War, as you're telling us. So I wonder if I can just expand you a bit. I mean, you've made a wonderful uh, 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 um, defense, if you like, uh, of the uh, usefulness, uh, the brilliance, in fact, of newspapers during the Second World War. But do you think, in a sense, what you're saying is, that helps explain why ultimately our home front didn't crack and why we were ultimately victorious. I think it's a very important point and one which I recognise and agree with almost entirely, Lawrence. Indeed, I would suggest that amongst the reasons that Britons were so committed to the war effort was because they understood what that war effort was for, had it encapsulated in terms which resonated with them by newspapers with which they were not ideologically friendly. Mm. and trusted those titles to tell them a version of the war justification story, which made it relevant to them and their loved ones. The Mirror is a particularly good example in the sense that it is plain throughout the war that it recognises that an overwhelming majority of its readers are either serving in the armed forces or are the families of people who are. And therefore it felt the need to make the case for war in language which could justify it to them. And that included in the Mirror's case, the argument that a just and civilised war in defence of democracy would result in and must result in a fairer society. So yes, I think that argument about about the extent to which liberty engages and that newspapers act as a mechanism of transmission in which, in which engagement is achieved in democracies at war is emphatically the case. And having a son who has um, worked for the BBC in Ukraine um, during this war, I can see that happening there, although the censorship is perhaps a little more rigid than it was even in Britain between, in 1940. Well, Jim, we share something else because I have a daughter in the British Embassy in Kiev. She's been there for a year organising Britain's humanitarian aid package to Ukraine. Uh, we're very proud, but also sometimes rather worried. Um, so obviously there's another point of, of, of contact. But what I wanted to ask also is perhaps picking up something you just said about the Daily Mirror. Um, in a sense, I, I thought you were almost too critical of the press in regard to the Holocaust. Um, in some ways, the testimony that you provided shows that all the press, left and right, was aware of what was going on and did try to inform their readers. But you can understand it from uh, both the newspaper's point of view and the audience's point of view, the readership. What they cared about were their sons, their brothers, their husbands overseas, uh, and that Britain should come through this. Uh, and that this was, you know, another dimension of the war, which was almost unimaginable, difficult to get one's head round. Uh, but it wasn't what was, in, in a sense, absolutely crucial to the millions of people reading newspapers daily. Uh, and I have some understanding and sympathy for that, really. I, I wouldn't be perhaps as critical as you uh, in the way you've presented that. That's, that's intriguing. Um, my criticism really extends simply to the assertion made by the Daily Mirror that there could be nobody who didn't know. I think that there were genuinely many who didn't, because it wasn't, if you like, rammed down their throats on the front pages in the way that really high profile news was consistently. So, for example, during the Blitz, there would be front page news about the bombing day after day after day, illustrated with newly identified human interest stories to ensure that this story was made relevant to the readers. None of the newspapers attempted to do that with the news of the Holocaust for many of the reasons that you very accurately identify, but also because they didn't perceive it as being a casus belli, which their readers would I would appreciate or even think about particularly hard. It was a subject which engaged the liberal readers of The Guardian with much greater intensity than it engaged the readers of The Mirror, The Express, The Mail, or indeed The Daily Herald. And again, you see that 
nuanced coverage where the truly liberal title recognizes that its sophisticated graduate readers will take and understand and regard this as a crucial issue one which will endure long before, beyond victory whereas for the mirror it was about getting the boys home safe and getting to berlin first absolutely yeah yeah interesting we've had a, a very interesting question just come in uh, and somebody's asking really about advertisements in newspapers during wartime uh, whether those advertisements in a sense reflected the military position whether they in fact perhaps reflected uh, uh, political positions you know some of the themes that you've drawn attention to to what extent are the advertisements sort of influenced uh, by the war uh, changed and to what extent do advertisements perhaps uh, add to uh, the kind of democratic culture that you're uh, suggesting? Uh, it's an intriguing question. I'm afraid there is a rather pedestrian but nevertheless significant answer. Newspapers experienced dramatic reductions in pagination during the yeah. Second World War. The tabloid papers at the peak of the newspaper's news print shortage in the early months of 1943 were down to only four pages mm -hmm. throughout the war they were between four and a maximum of eight pages from titles which had, had 32 page pages before the war the broadsheet newspapers maintained slightly larger newspapers often 10 or 12 pages in the guardian and times by virtue of restricting their circulation i.e they re relied on selling to a reduced number of readers but keeping a larger pagination as a result there was not as much space for advertising and yes of course newspapers did take advertising but of course rationing meant that many of the products which were most worth advertising was simply not available and therefore there was an extent to which advertising was about maintaining the presence of a brand until after the war and many advertising executives described it in those terms that they would keep their product on the front page of an expensive newspaper because one day people might be able to buy Fife's chocolate cream again and they would therefore be able to remember that it existed but really there wasn't a great deal around and if you didn't have the ration coupons you weren't going to get any of it yeah, well, I'm old enough to remember Fry's chocolate cream. I'm not sure you can get it anymore, but I, I remember it. But that leads then to another question about newspaper finance. I mean, if they're not getting advertising revenue in at all, or very little, uh, they're dependent almost entirely on the readership buying the newspaper. Um, was there any state funding or any private funding of newspapers to keep them going through uh, obviously what must have been a lean period for them? These were, when war began, colossally profitable titles. Um, to the question of subsidy, in certain places, yes, certainly. The Daily Herald, for example, had subsidy from the Trade Union Congress, which, of course, was a 50% shareholder in the Daily Herald. Um, the Daily Worker was, throughout, paid for by the Communist Party of Great Britain via its friends in Moscow. So direct subsidy there. Did Beaverbrook subsidise the Express? He didn't need to. It was less profitable because there wasn't the advertising revenue, but there was colossal circulation. There was a diminished staff. There was diminished pagination. So the availability of newsprint reduced cost as well because you were printing fewer copies in in smaller in smaller quantities. And um, candidly, there was also help with the transports facility um during the war and that probably reduced costs substantially i haven't looked at that particular aspect of the economics of the, of the newspaper industry particularly closely but essentially advertising continues it's smaller people are paying almost out of sentiment but also to keep their products in the public eye the papers are smaller the staffs are smaller and they are reaching colossal circulations which grow throughout the war so actually newspapers which were profitable in 1939 were equally profitable by the end of war in some cases more so gosh interesting um so just to move on i mean you've given us you know four fascinating case studies um but one of the things that we haven't touched on is uh, although it does of course occur because you showed us press criticism particularly of anderson shelters and so forth but the the question of disaffection at home and i'm thinking of things like strikes for example and industrial action uh as well as perhaps uh, wider disaffection uh, not just to the blitz uh, but to rationing and so forth i mean um particularly where labor relations were concerned and there were strikes in the coal mines and so forth yeah. did that affect the way the newspapers 
uh, dealt with this thing? Did they did they feel under an obligation to take a kind of pro-government, anti-worker line? Uh, or were they uh, very open in the way they presented things like the Kent miners' strike? No, they weren't very open in the way that they depicted strikes. And in that sense, there is a genuine impression that the united pressure of a coalition consisting both of Ernest Bevin and Winston Churchill was able to persuade the papers, uh, the mainstream papers, uh, to behave themselves. Of course, the Daily Worker could not be persuaded to behave itself and was a constant thorn in the side. Indeed, I would suggest that the banning of the Daily Worker was a, a distinct mistake by the government, by the wartime government, in the sense that the worker achieved such tiny circulation that it was only of interest to those who were already loyal to the cause. But in its particular coverage, which I look at in the book of the Clyde Bank bombing, the, the worker was the one paper that was willing to recognise that there was a strike at John Brown's shipyard, that that strike involved its shop stewards, that the government was absolutely determined to break that strike and to look at that in great care. But no, the mainstream press were willing to abide by what the Ministry of Information and the censors wanted them to do over industrial action at home. And it's a legitimate criticism of those titles. Is it a, does it undermine the argument I make that they were essentially serving their readers? The overwhelming evidence from what I've looked at was that most readers thought strikes in wartime were utterly unacceptable. And I suspect that that, that helped to persuade both the Herald and the Mirror that there was not, this was not of course worth fighting. There were, there were many causes that they did see as worth fighting and they fought them with great zeal and infuriated Churchill by doing so. Indeed, as I'm sure you're aware, he was determined to ban both the Sunday Pictorial and the Daily Mirror and have their editors sent off to fight at the front because he couldn't quite persuade the House of Commons that this was a great idea. But no, they were not good at, at reporting industrial action. Well, then that leads to another question uh, of, again, of military reversals, because in a way we, we haven't talked about that. And one can imagine how after 1943, uh, when the war turns, uh, the press is able to present very optimistic and uh, positive reports from the field. But until uh, 1942, that was not the case. And I wonder how they deal with, you know, those awful defeats, uh, be it Dunkirk, or we know that can be turned into a heroic kind of story and was so. That's a, pati that's a particular story, yes. yes. But things like Singapore, for example, uh, later on in early 42, how that was how that was done. I mean, how how honest were they with the British people about the military situation, at least until America's entry into the war, for example? They were honest about the facts. They were honest about the reverses. They did not have a great deal of colour in many cases. There is one absolutely stark exception, and that is in the coverage of the Royal Navy. Um, I should take a step back. One of the great challenges newspapers faced with any information about the activities of the armed forces or about British reverses abroad was that their sole source of information was government, Ministry of Information and the service departments. These, they did not have reporters on the scene or when they did, those reporters did not have the capacity to report without going through government wires, government radio services, which would enable censorship. Indeed, that was a major mechanism by which censorship could be applied. But no, the government re itself recognised and the newspapers recognised that being honest about defeats was essential or one would not be believed if one reported victories. And there was a legacy memory of the First World War still very vividly alive in many newsrooms. These two conflicts were, after all, not that long apart. And young men who had been junior reporters at the end of the First World War were certainly in senior positions in newspapers in 1940. And they knew that propaganda of the most blatant kind had left a long and very difficult distrust 
of the newspaper paper industry. The servicemen returning from the front had been appalled by the way that their struggles on the on the front in 1914-18 had been depicted. So there was a much much more realistic approach to reporting this, to reporting casualties in the RAF when the RAF began night bombing of Germany, to reporting the losses even of the Dambuster raid, which of course is presented with great glee and with great national pride, but there is no attempt to hide the fact that of those planes that, that have gone out, only just over half have returned and there's a crew of seven in every one of them. So there is not concealment. The big distinct, the big story, which perhaps was transformative in the way that we see that event is Dunkirk. Um, mm. The problem at Dunkirk was that there wasn't a single correspondent on the beaches who could actually file to his newspaper. Mm -hmm. They had no mechanism of reporting back. Mm -hmm. So although some journalists did fall back with the British Expeditionary Force and the French forces to the beaches between Depana and Dunkirk, they couldn't file. Mm -hmm. Everything that was written was written by correspondents on the docks as the boats came back in. And they were being briefed with great effect by the Royal Navy, which was very proud of its successes and um, which limited information to those who behaved themselves. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to read a glowing account of Dunkirk, I recommend The Guardian's front page story on Dunkirk, which um, mm -hmm. makes it sound utterly glorious. Yeah, very good. Well, now I want to end since we've discovered that both of us have uh, a strong interest in the Ukraine conflict. Uh, I just wondered if, you know, reflecting on the way the British press, uh, leave aside the BBC, although you may want to make comment on that, um, the way the press and, and broadcasting in general has covered the Ukraine war. Uh, do you see any parallels? Uh, do you see any weaknesses, any differences? What would you say? Um, well, I bring to this experience of having covered several wars for the BBC and newspapers as well ah, as right. having written about it. Mm. Um, I think that what I see in coverage of the Ukraine is a very clear ideological commitment to the Ukrainian cause, which of course I share, yeah. and one which perhaps colours some of the journalists normal sceptical approach to power. I know how difficult that is. I think it's almost, it's very difficult to resist going native when you're covering a war which you know to be just against a power that you know to be in the wrong. And I think that most of us would acknowledge that we are sympathetic with Ukraine as a flawed but nevertheless democratic society invaded by Russia, which is neither of those things. Mm. Uh, sorry, the utterly flawed piston. Yeah. Isn't <laughs> um, so I see a tendency to see the best in Ukraine. I see a slight reluctance to look for the blemishes. I'm conscious that until Ukraine was invaded, we were all aware that there were deep-seated problems of corruption in the Ukrainian system of government and in relations between government and industry. Whilst we see it mentioned in some of our more intelligent titles, and again, there is a parallel with my analysis of the Second World War, The Economist will look at this, the FT will look at this, but the mainstream papers on the whole are in the cheerleading mode. I understand that. We're getting some great colour reporting. We're great, getting some great eyewitness reporting. We're getting some very brave reporting from correspondents who are risking their lives to bring the news. We shouldn't exaggerate their courage, but it is dangerous. And um, it is something that, as a young reporter, I was proud to do and sometimes very frightened to do. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I see a tendency towards championing rather than scrutinizing and yeah. i think that some of that scrutiny would perhaps be healthy but in line with what you said actually brilliantly in your talk uh, in a sense also uh, the press and broadcasting is reflecting back to readers and viewers what readers and viewers believe as well there's a sense from what you said in the second world war and now that it's not just uh, the way journalists see the problem or see the conflict they know that their readership also sees it in a certain way and they and they're influenced by that as well and i imagine that was strongly felt among journalists in the second world war also that absolutely and i mean it's, it, it's a crucial point in all analysis of the press that newspapers are commercial products which sell because they achieve the loyalty of their readers and they cannot achieve the loyalty of their readers by challenging their readers deeply 
deeply held beliefs or only very occasionally and on issues about which editors feel particularly passionately and that's rare so of course newspapers reflect the views and the sympathies of their readers it's why a plurality and diversity of newspapers is important it's also why those weekly political titles those very high-minded intelligent analytical titles are a particular adornment to our democracy now as they were then they understand that their readers are willing to read something which challenges their beliefs they're prepared to consider the counterintuitive they are prepared to think hard about the alternative perspective and i'm proud to, and delighted to say we still have that in the new statesman we still have it in the spectator we still have it in the economist we still have it i think in the financial times we have got some fantastic weekly publications we've got some fantastic coverage on the bbc and also now in broadcasting challenging newcomers such as times radio which are really bringing to our mediascape a new and intelligent alternative to the great national broadcaster so things are healthy but yes i've never depicted newspapers as flawless they are not they are certainly not flawless but as a as a market as a diverse range of titles with different ideological stances at different levels of intelligence and analysis mm. they still serve an extraordinarily valuable purpose and they mm. are serving their readers interests and that is where you are absolutely spot on mm. well thank you very much indeed tim you you talked about that phrase adornment of democracy and i think actually your book sounds to me as if it's an adornment of democracy insofar as it studies a crucial phase in the development of our democratic media. Uh, you've done us all a very great service. I look forward to reading the book myself. This has been a wonderful taster of, of what's in it uh, and a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing the press and the Second World War with us today. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.